I'm in for it now. The Percy Jackson movies. What were they thinking? So, the Percy Jackson Disney Plus series is coming out. At time of writing, it hasn't come out just yet, but I actually have some faith that it'll be good. Not everything I've seen has left me frothing at the mouth, but I haven't seen any major red flags, and Rick Riordan is heavily involved creatively, which is good. But no matter the quality of it, there's at least a guarantee that it'll be better than the two movies that 20th Century Fox made. I'm gonna try and keep this as succinct as possible, but there's a lot to unpack here. I was a big Percy Jackson fan in high school. I was never much of a reader before these books. I would read, but I would never mentally internalize the things I was reading, because let's just say I'm something of a demigod myself. But then I got the Percy Jackson books for Christmas in freshman year, and it was the first book series that I've ever been truly entranced in. And once I graduated from high school, I didn't really have time for casual reading anymore, and I fell so far out of the loop that I didn't even realize until 2022 that Rick Riordan had written an entire third series, Trials of Apollo. Technically, it was like the fifth series, but third series in that specific series. But thanks to the magic of audiobook, not sponsored by the way, I've been able to re-experience this entire series as an adult, and I will say it definitely still holds up pretty well. I can still enjoy these stories all these years later, but now that I'm older, it's hard to deny that there are some things that become clear to me with a more keen critical eye as well as a greatly diminished tolerance for stupidity. These are books that are definitely written for their audience, which is not a bad thing at all, but it can lend the dialogue a level of inauthenticity at times. From my experiences, teenagers and even preteens are way more horrible and way raunchier in how they speak than how they're portrayed in these books, so it just felt off to me. I mean, if Seaweed Brain is the worst you can come up with, I can list off at least 15 different nicknames I had growing up that are way more deep cutting than that one, but saying them out loud would probably get this video taken down. I think the only book I've ever read that authentically portrays how teenagers communicate is one called Swim the Fly. That's not a flaw with the series, that's just kind of what you get when you have a book series that's targeted at kids 10 to 15 years old. But then there's Rick Riordan's insistence on shoehorning pop culture references into his books. It becomes painfully obvious the first book came out in 2005 when Hilary Duff is brought up, and then there's one exchange in the third book about Jesse McCartney and Green Day that makes me gag. And it only gets worse as the books go on, especially in Trials of Apollo. Then honestly, while I think most of the books in this story arc are very good, there are a few that stick out to me that are just generally not great, at least in my opinion. The Titan's Curse, for example, is a bit hard for me to get through because despite succeeding at world building and pushing the stakes to the next level in preparation for the final two books, I find most of the cast, especially Bianca, completely unlikable. Then Blood of Olympus is an incredibly unsatisfying conclusion to the Heroes of Olympus story arc, and of course there's also Trials of Apollo Book 3, The Burning Maze, an entire story built around several incredibly unforgivably egregious retcons that also stars Piper, a perennial wet blanket of a character, and Jason, who's probably my least favorite character that Rick Riordan's ever written, with the exception of Bianca. That said, however, these are all still fun, adventurous books that have a great sense of humor, likable characters most of the time, and are overall a very intelligent reinterpretation of classic Greek myths into the modern day. And apparently 20th Century Fox thought so too, considering that they decided to buy the rights extremely early into the book series' existence. You see, in the wake of the Harry Potter film series' success, the film industry collectively realized that there was a growing niche for young adult novels being adapted into movies, especially if there was potential for a long series to be made out of them. Twilight, Divergent, The Hunger Games, Maze Runner, these all being made into film series around the same time was not a coincidence. And while The Lightning Thief adaptation wasn't the first of this kind, it was probably the most blatant. It was so obvious from the beginning that they were attempting to make this into the next Harry Potter, considering they literally got Chris Columbus to direct the Lightning Thief movie, who also famously directed the first two Harry Potter movies. So cards on the table, they theoretically knew what they were doing, and the result was... No, 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 no. In fairness, it's hard for me to separate myself and view these movies objectively because I'm so familiar with the books. But I'll try to examine these films as films in their own right, as well as how they adapt the books. I'm trying to be fair. 
But anybody who knows anything about the Percy Jackson movies knows that to call them adaptations is an insult to the concept of adaptations, because they are almost so removed from the events of the books that they might as well be their own thing, especially The Lightning Thief. Right from the intro, we already have an issue, and this is an issue that many people have gone over in the past, but it's still worth bringing up. In the book, the characters are supposed to be 12. There's a lot of inherent differences to the storytelling if you have a 12-year-old versus a 16-year-old because there's a lot of inherent differences between a 12-year-old and a 16-year-old. This is important to their characterization because, quite frankly, it's a lot more compelling in fiction to have danger happening to kids than teens or adults. Because we instinctively know that kids, by their very nature, are ill-prepared for the dangers of the world, especially when those dangers are larger than life. Basically, among other things, there's a lot of storytelling power dynamics that are negatively affected by aging the characters up. Plus, the age of the characters helps the target audience identify, seeing as this series was targeted at a preteen audience. But most of all, their personalities and growth as characters is tied to their ages. Childish rivalries, immaturities, bullying, insecurities over your friends or how you compare to your friends, jealousy, the process of maturing, the process of growing feelings for people as you grow older. These are all inherent themes within the books that work because in younger characters, these elements are endearing, but they don't work in people who were already more mentally mature. So you either risk having your characters be completely unlikable, or you have to completely uproot the personalities in order to have them fit a different age archetype, skipping a lot of the character development and essentially forcing these characters to be almost completely unrecognizable. I would say they chose the latter in this case. I understand that with the way movies are made, it's probably hard to incorporate child actors who grow in accordance to the characters they portray, because it's easy to make a 25-year-old actor actor look 16, but it's impossible to make a 16-year-old actor look 12. So there's the risk of them aging out of the roles too quickly, along with all the other issues with child actors, but that's still no excuse to completely uproot this very central aspect to the stories, especially when this is Chris Columbus we're talking about, a guy who made really good movies working with child actors. Sadly, I think Logan Lerman would have been a great choice to play Percy had he been younger. I remember catching this one movie on Disney Channel back when I was like 14 called Hoot and I thought that Logan Lerman was a pretty spot-on representation in that movie. So he was the right actor at the wrong time. In fact, I would go as far as to say that many of these actors cast were actually pretty spot-on, or could have been pretty spot-on in another timeline. Pierce Brosnan as Chiron, Sean Bean as Zeus, Uma Thurman as Medusa, and then there's Catherine Keener and Joe P Joe as Sally and Gabe respectively, those two nail the dynamic of the too-good-for-this-world wife and the abusive husband. My only criticism is that they didn't go nearly far enough with these two because in the book they go to some really dark places, which added a cathartic sting to Gabe being turned to stone. Anyways, I could go on talking about how great the cast was here. I think the one who was almost unrecognizable but in a good way would be Brandon T. Jackson as Grover, because, to be honest, this version of Grover is actually much better than the book's interpretation in my opinion. Not gonna lie guys, my recent revisits to the series really shed a light on how I really don't like Grover much. I know, I know, boo if you want. I find that he's a bit of a priss and is extremely preachy, so turning him into a sassy, smack-talking, comedy relief best friend archetype to me is cliched, but an upgrade. Plus, Brandon is super charismatic, so what could have ended up being super eye-rolling ends up being actually very charming. But probably the most baffling character change, but in a bad way, would be Annabeth. The problem with Annabeth's character in the movie is that they essentially folded her character and Clarice's character together. Clarice in the books was a child of Ares who targeted Percy because he was the new kid, however Percy ended up embarrassing her via toilet water, which essentially kickstarted a years-long rivalry. She was an important foil and was extremely central to several of the stories. Not having her be there from the beginning either uproots the story or makes her sudden inclusion as an important character later on come clean out of nowhere. And by combining these two personalities into one character, it makes Annabeth come across as completely inconsistent, and at times like she's not even human. Alexandra Daddario is great, but this ain't it, Chief. She might as well have been Clarice, considering that despite paying lip service to being the daughter of the Goddess of Wisdom and Strategy, it doesn't come across in her actual actions. Take the creek scene during the Capture the Flag game, where Percy gets his ass kicked and self-heals, for example. During this entire scene, I'm wondering what the hell her strategy was supposed to be. 
wait for somebody to walk over and then beat the crap out of them? My mother is goddess of wisdom and battle strategy. Right. What I loved about the book version of this scene was how completely regardless of Percy's own well-being, Annabeth knew that Clarice had a grudge against Percy for the toilet incident. So she stationed Percy in an obscure corner of the battlefield, knowing that Clarice and her goons would go after him, leaving a gap in their defenses. It was a good scene that characterized Annabeth as fiercely intelligent, but also somebody who had no perspective for other people. The way it's portrayed here makes her come across as brash and kind of stupid in all honesty. Like, she has no actual plan. She just pops up when Percy pops up. In fact, I don't think she ever comes up with a plan in either of these movies. Percy comes up with more plans than she does, and he's supposed to be the dumb one. The exclusion of Clarice from this movie is one of the many omissions and alterations they made. Talk to any fan of the book, and they will tell you that this is the worst part of the movie. They had absolutely no respect for the source material. Clarice, an important antagonistic foil for Percy, not in the first movie. Ares, not even in the movie. Which means the abandoned theme park scene isn't in the movie, which was an important scene for characterization and future plot. They instead replace it with a scene in Nashville. Which is funny because they still have a scene in a diner, just without Ares. The entire thing about the shoes that Luke gave Percy being cursed so that they were supposed to pull him into Tartarus, and also the part about Percy giving them to Grover, none of that was mentioned. And guess what? Kronos' entire involvement in the story is omitted. Annabeth's history with Luke is omitted, as is her fear of spiders, and even her cap of invisibility. All of which puts a significant dent in her story importance. There's so many aspects missing or completely removed that would have greatly improved this movie. I've heard it said that Percy's one-on-one -on -one duel with Ares on the shoreline of the Santa Monica beach was almost tailor-made for cinema. Most damningly, the entire concept of the mist is omitted. The mist, if you don't know, was in the books this magical veil that separated the magical world from the mortal world. Mortal minds couldn't comprehend the world of gods and monsters without it completely breaking them, so the mist acts as a filter in order to make the magical world appear as mundane to mortals. You might see a hellhound as a poodle, for example. And it's a genius idea that essentially quashes any question about how the magical world can coexist with the human world and not have it incite mass panic. The list goes on and on and on. It all comes across as so disrespectful. You gotta wonder why they even bothered licensing the book when they clearly didn't even care. Okay, with that out of the way, what do we got here? Well, troubled 16-year-old Percy Jackson is slumming through life in a terrible high school when he discovers that he's the son of Poseidon. Then his mother is seemingly killed as they're making their way to the safe haven for demigods called Camp Half-Blood, and Percy is accused of stealing Zeus's lightning bolt to incite a war between the gods. Most notably, he's accused by Hades, who will exchange the bolt for Percy's mother. So Percy, his best friend and protector Grover, and the wildcard Annabeth all sneak out in order to travel across the country to find the entrance to Hades in order to confront the god Hades to try and convince him to give Percy's mother back because Percy is not the lightning thief. In the meantime, they have to collect some magical pearls which will act as their escape from Hades, and there's this really obviously bitter mentor character named Luke Castellan who helps the three of them sneak out on this illegal quest against Chiron's wishes, and even offers them some magical items he conveniently has. And if that isn't a crimson flag, I don't know what is. I think once you strip out all the external context and examine this movie for what it is, well, get ready for some damning with fine praise. It certainly has its moments. There's some genuinely good lines that cracked me up. Only use it in times of severe distress. This is a pen. This is a pen. You have a real horse's ass. They got free sodas. <laughs> okay, that's nasty. But otherwise, I feel the whole movie just has a very safe and obvious element to it that makes it kind of boring. You have a scene where somebody cuts the heads off a hydra without knowing the hydra can grow its heads back. You have a series of scenes in Hades where the entire place is modeled after Christian hell. It's even referred to as hell in some instances, which is both inaccurate and insultingly standard. What will you do? I'm already in hell. You have Luke giving a generic bad guy speech before the big overblown CGI fight. 
it's also mind-numbingly standard. I guess my main issue with this kind of Hollywoodified version of the whole concept is that the books were pretty accurate modern-day reinterpretations of Greek mythological stories. Whereas this takes the same concept and puts it through the ringer because certain things can't exist in the generic Hollywood production. You can't cover lesser-known Greek stories, it needs to be the well-known ones. Hades can't just be a domain for the dead, where some people are punished, some people are rewarded, but most people dwell in the fields of Asphodel for all of time. It has to be hell. The Greek gods can't be portrayed as near enough irredeemable like an actual mythology, they have to have actual redeemable qualities, hence Poseidon being forbidden from seeing Percy, not he just doesn't have time for him. But then on the opposite side of the same coin, you have Hades. Hades is traditionally one of the more reasonable gods, but it can't be as such in this movie, he needs to be this universe's version of Satan. He needs to be undisputedly evil. Then of course, you can't just get into random encounters on your way to a destination, everything has to have a purpose, hence the pearls. It feels like a really messy, generic story of modern Greek mythology that can't be saved even by good performances. Even the set design and shooting style is fairly generic. It makes sense that when I originally saw the trailer for this movie, I thought it looked like a Harry Potter knockoff because that's kind of how the set design looks. But things like Olympus were always described as this beautiful, otherworldly work of art, but it looks kind of standard. I mean, look at those thrones, they couldn't be more basic if you tried. Then there's the shooting style, which is fairly boring, lots of flat shots. And the lighting style is always one of two things, spotlights or evenly lit rooms. Where's the imagination, guys? This is another world we're looking at. Nothing about this movie is all that memorable visually, with one exception. I think that the Lotus Hotel scene is not only very visually interesting, but is actually the best part of the movie overall. They turned the whole Lotus Hotel thing into an extended party scene, which I think perfectly captures the concept of the Land of the Lotus Eaters as people completely zonked out and completely blissfully ignorant. It's a very fun scene that's beautifully shot and lit, and I will say that the one benefit of having these characters be 16 instead of 12 is that it makes the escape more exciting in that they can steal a car and drive out. In fact, I feel like the Lotus Hotel staff trying to stop them from leaving was actually a vast improvement over the book where they just kind of walk out. I will also give praise to the Medusa scene, Uma Thurman absolutely kills it in this role. And while there's a lot of contrivance in this scene, especially with that one lady who is just running around trying to warn Annabeth of Medusa's presence and then ends up being the sole person to open her eyes was f***ing stupid. But regardless, it's a good scene with good acting and is definitely a standout scene in the movie. Is there anything else I can really praise? I thought the CGI water healing was pretty cool. In fact, I think the CGI generally is pretty good. Even despite this movie being somewhat on the lower end of production cost. I like the part where Grover hits Smelly Gabe. I guess I liked the ending stinger with Medusa's head in the fridge. So there's definitely a lot of individual moments that are good in a vacuum, none of which really save the movie from being utterly bog standard. But you want to know what I actually think the most damning flaw with this movie is? In this instance, the entire evil scheme of the main antagonist doesn't actually make any sense. The entire lightning bolt theft was supposed to be a false trail. Luke sends Percy and co. into the underworld with the bolts, and this is supposed to result in Olympus going to war. But like, what stake does Hades have in all this? You know, him being the one to set off the quest by showing up in the middle of camp is a giant plot hole because there's no way Luke knew that was going to happen. If not, is Luke just making up his plan as he goes, or something? If so, it makes Luke's entire plan, which was already vapid as hell, revolve around a severe amount of coincidence. First of all being that Hades wanted the lightning bolt to begin with and was gonna have leverage against Percy. What's his plan here? If Luke's plan was to cause a war between the gods by taking away the bolt and nothing else, then in that case, the biggest plot hole is, why give it to Percy at all? What's the benefit in having him bring the bolt to the underworld? Hades wanted to return the bolt just as much as Percy did. That is until he randomly flips on a dime and decides he wants to rule Olympus. You could say he's lying, but there's no indication of that. It comes across as merely inconsistent characterization. But the gods were gonna rip each other apart regardless of who had the bolt, so why send Percy and company on a wild goose chase? 
On a side note, a really notable nitpick. The entire reason they survive the conflict with Hades is because Persephone saves them. But Persephone is not supposed to be here. Per the marriage agreement between her and Hades, she spends the fall and winter with Hades, then spring and summer is spent in the overworld. She even alludes to this, and yet this movie takes place in late spring and she's still in Hades. So like, what gives? Shouldn't they at least have the barest understanding, or at least desire to be accurate, to Greek mythology within this movie? Anyways, back to Luke. Possibly my biggest criticism for his portrayal as the villain is thus. Why did Luke reveal himself as the villain in the end? If his first plan failed, why did he have to give the big bad speech and then fight Percy in a stupid overblown CGI boss fight? He could have feigned ignorance, bided his time, and waited until his next opportunity if he was still ostensibly innocent. Oh, well he planted the bolts in his own shield, so obviously they were going to suspect him. Well, that just further begs the question of why did he plant the bolt in such a way to immediately incriminate himself when it was discovered? Luke is an idiot! See, it's not just the fact that this movie is completely inaccurate, it's the fact that once you start removing key elements from the story, the plot ceases to make any sense. And can I just say, Luke is such an obvious villain. Whatever subtlety was there in the book has been completely and utterly ripped out. He's openly antagonistic and resentful towards the gods, he's obviously a rule breaker, he has sort of a sly I'm not telling you something undercurrent to his performance. This guy couldn't be a more obvious bad guy if he had a shirt on that just said Judas. This entire movie has a severe lack of subtlety, but this is the most egregious. So yeah, I really don't have much good to say about this movie, and I feel like it could have been so much more. It all comes down to that aspect of taking a good fantasy adventure novel and making it into generic Hollywood plop. Most people will say this movie fails as an adaptation, but it's good in its own right. I disagree. I think it's kind of generic either way. But it made money, which is the most important part, meaning they were still gonna make a sequel. By this point, I was fully aware that the Lightning Thief movie was nothing like the books. But I was still excited for Sea of Monsters. I thought they were clearly taking the right lessons from the first movie. They started introducing characters that should have been there from the start, Annabeth was blonde, and they even said in pre-release interviews that they wanted to be more faithful to the books. The cool thing about this movie is that it does follow the books Perfectly. Well, and in the book, book in the book, I actually just reread the book last night on the plane over here, and and I was delighted by all the scenes with Grover. Thank and you. The wedding dress, and, I and in hindsight, I would say that Sea of Monsters is actually my favorite book in the original series, with the exception of possibly the Last Olympian. And I know that kind of deviates from what a lot of people will say, but I have one very specific reason for that, and that's the cast of characters. Grover is barely in the book, and the main trio is Annabeth, Percy, and Tyson. I friggin love Tyson, he's a big goofy lummox you can't help but cheer for. So just for that alone, I loved the book. Meaning, this movie had a lot to live up to. So how did it turn out? When I went back and re-watched this movie in preparation for this video, I had the flu. Like a really bad flu. And if there's one way to make the experience of this movie worse, I'd like to hear it. I must have been 16 when I saw this movie for the first and only time before today, because I speak no hyperbole when I say I had never been so ungodly pissed off in my life while watching a movie. Ironically. I gaslit myself into believing that I didn't hate it, but I definitely hated it. These days I think hate is a strong word, but I really, really, really don't like it. But here's the thing, I, I, I can't help but kind of feel bad for this movie. Because it was trying to do something that was largely impossible. Trying to get the series back on track as far as following the plot of the books. But the problem is, they botched the Lightning Thief so ungodly bad that there's a lot of things that needed to be established that just weren't. So it felt like they were playing catch up from the beginning. But that still doesn't make up for some of the, well, let's just say baffling creative choices in this movie. Still, I do at least kind of appreciate what they were trying to do. 
What I found when I watched this movie is that unlike the first movie, this at least attempts to incorporate all the major necessary scenes and plot beats from the book as best as they could given that they had a really poor foundation to work with. So this means that a lot of the elements from the book that were adapted into the movie kind of take place out of order and or in a somewhat different way. But they do happen, which I give them points for. The plot this time around is thus. So there was this girl named Thalia, or Thalia, I've heard both pronunciations, who was a daughter of Zeus. She was being guided along to Half-Blood Hill by Grover alongside Luke and Annabeth. But she decided to make her last stand on Half-Blood Hill and ended up dying, but Zeus took pity on her and turned her into a pine tree. And her essence in this case created a protective barrier around camp. However, unbeknownst to the Half-Bloods at camp, the tree has been poisoned by Luke, so the protective barrier is failing. Also, fun fact, this guy right here, I used to skateboard with him. So Annabeth, Percy, Grover, and the newly introduced Tyson go on a quest to find the Golden Fleece, as it's the only thing that can save the tree, and by extension, camp. The Fleece is on the island of Polythemus, the ancient Cyclops who captured Odysseus in the Iliad. Meanwhile, Luke and his cronies are also after the Fleece because he wants to use it to revive Kronos via this giant sarcophagus. So the race is on to try and find this elusive Fleece. Meanwhile, Percy is met by his aforementioned half-brother Tyson, who's a Cyclops. Now, much like the last movie, they skip over a significant chunk of the book's intro, but it gets us right into the action with this Tower of Doom sports competition type thing at camp. This scene is a pretty concerted attempt to correct course. They finally get around to introducing Clarice, played by... What? Levin Rambin? Is that how that's pronounced? Now, I won't fault them for picking an actress as pretty as this one to play Clarice, because the way that Clarice was described in the books, I don't think there exists an actress who would fit that bill. But hey, she does capture the essence of Clarice because she is a right bitch in the best way possible. Either way, there's no doubt in my mind that adaptations like this do need to cut straight to the point in order to get the story into a two-hour format, and in that regard, this is an example of something that's a completely unique take, but is an incredibly effective scene. It's exciting and pretty well shot. Plus, it succinctly explains the differences in characterization between Percy and Clarice. Percy is loyal to a fault, willing to save other people even if it negatively affects himself, and Clarice is so competitive she'll take a victory even if it's a tainted victory. Plus, the action is punctuated by that one Fall Out Boy song that you could not get away from in 2013. You know the one. We're also introduced to Dionysus, played by Stanley Tucci, who is f***ing amazing! This right here is the absolute best line in the movie. You know, the Christians have a guy who can do this trick in reverse. Now that's a god. There is something that does stick out like a sore thumb right from the beginning, in that Pierce Brosnan did not reprise his role as Chiron. There's probably a good reason for that. In his place, they have Anthony Head. I actually think he's a good replacement. He plays that mentor role really well. I mean, no sh**, he played Giles on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So he was absolutely a good choice. A lot of the major deviations from the source material happen within the first 20 minutes or so. Aside from cutting the entire sequence before getting to camp, Chiron is not blamed for the poisoning of Thalia's tree, meaning that he's not dismissed in favor of Tantalus, the king in Greek mythology most famous for feeding his own children to the gods. They kind of folded aspects of Tantalus's character into Dionysus, including his seeming hatred for Percy and favoring of Clarice. And that's kind of the major thing that you'll notice with this story compared to the first is that you can kind of gauge a lot of the story not necessarily based on what was altered and excluded, but just by what was excluded. And the things that were altered from a movie standpoint make sense for the most part. Well, except for the mist's inclusion, but uh, yeah, I'll get to that. Which kind of brings this into the standard Harry Potter or Hunger Games-esque adaptation, which is basically what you'd expect for this sort of thing. Some things have been cut for time or practicality-based reasons, such as the Andromeda being a yacht instead of a cruise ship. While the story in theory had an uphill battle based on necessary points having to be quickly established, for much of the movie, they do as good of a job as you could have hoped. And much like last time, they have some good lines. What are you doing? Don't walk on my roof. Can I trust you? Uh, of course. Good. You'll need this. I had to crawl through the depths of Tartarus itself, then Cleveland, 
and they even have some good scenes. That whole scene with the Grey Sisters, for example, was pretty stellar. Or that scene with Nathan Fillion as Hermes in the UPS store. That was great. And much like last time, if a lot of this comes across as faint praise, well, that's because it's, you know, faint praise. Because while I may not have as much of an issue with this movie as an adaptation, at least until the end, I think this movie is genuinely not good. The most damning flaw I found was that it was just really damn boring. I got through the first movie in one sitting, but with Sea of Monsters, I had to keep pausing the movie and go do other things. I feel like part of that comes down to the main cast. The irony is that while the book may be one of my favorites for the fact that Grover is barely in it, I find that his absence is really felt here because without the humorous sidekick archetype, you're left with three characters who are not written interestingly enough to carry the narrative. This is especially apparent with Annabeth. It seems without the antagonistic aspects of Annabeth's character that came from merging her personality with Clarice's, the result is basically no personality whatsoever. It kind of comes back to that aspect of their decision to age these characters up and change their personalities fundamentally as a result. But like, a lot of her personality traits could have translated to the older version of the character just fine. She's fiercely intelligent, witty, stubborn, and her own fatal flaw is considered to be her hubris. None of that comes across in this movie. Nothing comes across in this movie. I didn't appreciate the way they butchered her character in the first movie, but I'd honestly prefer that over her complete non-character in Sea of Monsters. You twist the cap off this, you release the winds from the four corners of the earth. Now you tell me that isn't cool. Whoa, 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 no, not in here! Ladies and gentlemen, I give you your moron. Meanwhile, Tyson is the comedy relief character whose one central joke is that he's stupid, but something about the way his stupidity is portrayed here doesn't really work. I don't think he's portrayed stupid enough, or endearing enough to make it work. He comes across as a bit inept and clumsy, but nothing more. Plus, he has no arc or real moment of usefulness. He's constantly portrayed as a bumbling screw-up, but never does anything to prove himself to be more than that. I mean, he kinda saves Percy in the end, but in, like, the most half-assed way possible. Even his immunity to fire comes up all of once in the entire movie. And there's no mention of the natural skill of mechanical engineering that comes with being a Cyclops. So he ends up being a liability and nothing else. I think the inconsequentiality of Tyson being fireproof builds into what I think is one of the major issues with the story this time around. So much of the story feels so half-baked. There's this prominent subplot about whether or not Percy is a fraud. They have Clarice completely outdo Percy in the opening due to a fluke, and yet Percy is the one who has self-doubt. Then, not 15 minutes later, the bronze bull attacks and Clarice gets tossed around like a ragdoll after going in so confidently, and Percy is the one who ends up saving the day, essentially rendering that entire subplot disingenuous right from the beginning, despite the fact that it's supposed to be a pretty central plotline. Or how about how Percy is ashamed of Tyson being his brother? This comes up all of, like, twice in the movie, and then it's mostly dropped. Or you have certain things that are introduced so incredibly tokenly, like how the mist is introduced in this movie as a spray-on of all things. Which, by the way, is easily the second worst change they made in the movie. It turns this very central plot device in the books into a token excuse to have Tyson not be a Cyclops for a while. And it feels like it was put in so readers of the books couldn't claim that they didn't. And the same applies for things like Nectar, for example. But then there's also this scene in a cafe where it's implied that regular humans don't perceive the abnormalities of the mythical world. Does the mist exist as its own thing, but you can condense it? Maybe? I don't know. But if that was the case, what was even the point of the spray-on mist? Probably the special effects budget. Especially because the special effects in this movie are actually significantly worse than they were in the first movie. Like the bronze bowl that looks like a pre-rendered PS3 cutscene, or this explosion. Or how about Percy surfing this water spout? I'm assuming that with the previous movie not performing to the level they likely hoped, they probably cut the CGI budget, but it's pretty rough at times. Although I did think that retelling of the gods' fight against Kronos told in this stained glass style was actually very visually interesting and well presented. Though they did mispronounce Delphi at one point. I'm the spirit of Delphi. As a matter of fact, I think the entire Oracle scene was one of the better scenes in the movie, mostly because it was lit and shot in a relatively memorable way. 
because much like the previous movie, there really isn't much interesting to how this movie is shot or lit. Matter of fact, at least in the first movie, they had spotlighting. I don't even think they had spotlighting in this movie. It's mostly just evenly lit environments, and outside of a few tracking shots, I can't think of any particularly interestingly shot scenes. Now, I could go over this movie frame by frame and examine everything it does poorly, but at the end of the day, everything up until the last 20 minutes was problematic, but at least it was acceptable, I'd say. But I still viscerally remember what I felt when I first watched this final battle scene in theaters because I had literally never been so angry while watching a movie. Now, here's the thing. Do I think they needed to change the final battle sequence from the book? Absolutely. A one-on-one -on -one sword fight between Luke and Percy, where the deus ex machina is the party ponies? Yeah, that definitely wouldn't have played well in a movie, but reviving Kronos was straight up one of the most insulting things they could have done. Like taking the fifth book climax and just cramming it into the second movie? Like, what the hell? That goes so far beyond the point of being inaccurate that I don't even think I can properly articulate how to describe it. That destroys the entire narrative beyond recognition. I've heard it theorized before that they weren't sure if they were going to get a third movie, so they essentially played up the Kronos revival here just to say they did it. The problem is, I can't say how this plays on an objective level because my opinion on this series is anything but objective. All I know is how I felt when I first watched the movie. With that said though, seeing as this is only my second time watching the movie, this time I just felt... a bit apathetic. I just don't have the capacity to be outright mad at media anymore. With that said, this is a case where I feel the finale of the first movie would have fit better, because a big overblown CGI battle between Luke and Percy would have actually worked. And by doing that, you may have even had the time to include Polythemus in there somewhere. Polythemus is genuinely the biggest loser in this entire movie. His entire subplot, his near blindness, his attempts to marry Grover thinking he's a female cyclops, and the entire fight is blown off in like, what, five minutes or less? That is so lame, considering how much of a big deal he's supposed to be. This is his island, it's his fleece. Plus, it maybe would have served to make Luke come across as a lot less stupid than he does here. I mean, genuinely, Luke already came across as a complete idiot in the first movie, relying on a lot of coincidences and then revealing himself to be the villain when he really didn't need to. But he continues to be the dumbest antagonist in the history of media here. It's bad enough that he sends a couple of demigods ahead with Grover onto Polythemus' island to negotiate for the Fleece. While it's a throwaway line, it's noted that the demigods sent with Grover were killed by Polythemus. I haven't had a decent meal since those half-bloods you brought. And this stupid Fleece is supposed to lure satyrs! Meaning that Luke is actively a liability to his own army. But then his stupidity reaches critical mass when Kronos is revived. Apparently he didn't establish any sort of allyship with Kronos before reviving him, and so after reviving him, Luke ends up being eaten alive. And it's such a shame too, because Jake Abel, 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 whatever, has such a deliciously sinister delivery to his performance. Now that he's dropped any pretense of being a good guy, everything about his performance as a villain is stellar. Turns out you're not the only half-blood who's hard to kill. You know. Prophecy. But they really didn't know how to write him as anything but an idiot. Then, after a quick little brouhaha, Percy single-handedly sends Kronos back to the sarcophagus, neutering the threat of Kronos right from this early stage. And that's basically it. You have a couple of scenes back at camp and a sequel hook that ultimately leads nowhere, thank God. And that's the end of the 20th Century Fox Percy Jackson movies. Well, that was a load of shit. While The Lightning Thief was a bastardization, it was watchable. Sea of Monsters, on the other hand, I think is a better adaptation, but it's a much worse movie. It was hard to get through. You can't discount the fact that these movies were the result of a combined effort of hundreds of people, but that doesn't mean anything to me. I mean, one person that wasn't involved in that effort was Rick Riordan himself, who was actively excluded from the production altogether. Which is why it's become a running joke that he doesn't acknowledge these movies as ever having existed. And while there's certainly a case to be made that the largest chunk of the legacy behind these movies come down to how not to make an adaptation, there is another piece of the legacy of these movies for better or for worse, no matter how much Rick Riordan hates it. 
Bastardized as they may have been, these movies introduced the Percy Jackson series to an entire generation of people who may not have ever known about it. That was certainly what happened to me. I had never heard of the series before seeing The Lightning Thief in theaters. And I would have never gotten the book series for Christmas had it not been for the movie, and I'm sure that is a recurring theme for a lot of people. The irony is, while these movies may have been forgotten in the grand scheme of time, these movies drove more eyeballs to the books than one could have ever dreamed. Perhaps the Disney Plus series may have never been greenlit had these movies not bolstered the book's popularity for people like me. Which is honestly, all told, the best case scenario, opening the door and bringing some exposure but leaving no lasting impact. And hey, I look forward to watching the Disney Plus show, I have high hopes for it, especially because Rick Riordan is actually involved this time. And while there were a few things with the trailers that made me cock an eyebrow, I believe that whatever alterations are made this time around are going to be for a good reason, not for a lack of respect for the source material. That is, unless Rick Riordan is secretly a masochist. That's all I've got. If you like what I do here and want to support the channel, you can like this video, leave a comment telling me what you think, subscribe, and hit the notification icon so you're always up to date on what I'm doing. And if you want to support the channel in a more direct fashion, you can pledge to my Patreon for unique perks and rewards such as early access, Discord benefits, exclusive content, and more, along with these fine folks right here. And an extra special thank you to Billy Not Brooklyn, Chance Cranford, Dick Kickham, Gaz004, Layabout, My Name is Tank, Raph, Ty Trophy, and Weird Webster for going above and beyond. Elsewise than that, I've been the King of Snark Style right here on Tactical Bacon Productions, and I will see you next time. Stay crispy, my friends.